I now welcome representatives from the Australia Institute to the table. I understand that information on parliamentary privilege and the protection of witnesses and evidence has been provided to you. For the Hansard record, could you please state your full names and the capacities in which you appear today? Uh, Dr Richard Dennis, Executive Director of the Australia Institute. Polly Hemming, the Director of the Climate and Energy Program at the Australia Institute. Thank you. Um, written opening statements have been provided to us and will be published, um, so we'll go straight uh, to questions. I'll start with Senator um, Grogan. Thank you. Uh, I don't that's the opening there? statement. There's nothing. Oh, oh okay. okay. Sorry. Oh, my notes are... My, my <laughs> <laughs> okay, sorry. Happy um, to give you one. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't aware of that. I was just... I, it was, that was in my notes. Okay. So, um, Mr Dennis, do you have an opening statement? Uh, sure. Okay, uh, go ahead. Um, markets only operate efficiently and fairly under a narrow range of circumstances, and one of those circumstances is when consumers are well informed. Just as investors can't make good decisions uh, when information in balance sheets is misleading, and just as those with food allergies can't make good decisions if the ingredients on the side of a jar are misleading or in unreadably small font, it's obvious that consumers and investors can't make good decisions if companies are allowed or not prevented from making misleading, nonsensical or factually wrong claims. Obligations to disclose that a brand of food contains nuts is not anti-nut, it is pro-consumer. And requiring firms to take claims about being nut-free seriously isn't anti the nut industry, it is pro-consumer. It's bizarre that consumers or investors are expected to filter an enormous volume of information, and we've just heard Treasury say that they can't even expect ASX-listed companies to be across this information, and indeed we're talking about protecting listed companies from spurious allegations when, in fact, it's the spurious claims of firms that constitute the greenwashing that this inquiry is about. So I'll just hand over to Polly if she'd like to add anything, but thank you for calling us. We think the greenwashing is a, a new and important piece of law, and again, we just heard that it's not defined in law and uh, clearly there are abuses taking place. Thank you. Ms Hemmings? I was just going to add a, a comment acknowledging that greenwashing is a symptom of a number of complex and related and often contradictory policy failures uh, from state and federal governments. And the current context we find ourselves in uh, is very welcome, uh, but in real time the Australian government is still actively incentivising greenwashing in Australia because it is cheaper to greenwash than it is to legitimately decarbonise, but it is businesses and consumers who ultimately wear the cost of that. And to go to what uh, one of the previous uh, witnesses was saying, if it's hard for small businesses to legitimately make, uh, to prove the claims that they are making, but if we had government policy that made it cheaper to decarbonise, that regulated the larger businesses that evened the playing field for everyone, then the onus wouldn't be actually on those small <coughs> businesses to prove that what they were saying was true because we would know we had robust regulations in place that meant that everyone had to be reducing emissions in the same way that the Australian Government says is necessary to meet our climate targets for 2030 and 2050. Thank you. Um, Senator Grogan. Um, thank you for that. Um, now, we've heard a bit this morning about the kind of actions that have been taken um, and the sweep that's been done and the various things that ACCC and ASIC are doing um, and the moves within government to um, also bring in more um, uh, shine greater light on these issues. Um, and I think we also heard this morning, you would have heard um, that the ACCC is taking some proceedings against Clorox Australia um, for alleged greenwashing. Do you see these kind of actions that have been laid out this morning, and obviously given your work you'd be somewhat aware of, um, do, do you see these taking steps in the right direction? Oh, look, obviously uh, regulators putting greenwashing up as a priority is, is an important step. They're sending a signal when they talk about their uh, enforcement priorities, and I think that's a, a good step. But I just think that the, as long as the onus of proof 
is on individuals to get to the bottom of these things. As long as, as Polly said, uh, companies uh, operating in a complex environment where they might be doing the right thing, but someone else can make exactly the same claim by doing nothing. Uh, in, in such a complex policy environment, I, I think there's a lot more work that needs to be done. And if I go back 20 years, uh, we were having similar conversations around superannuation. We were having similar conversations around investment. That, you know, and, and if I go back 100 years, listed companies didn't publish balance sheets once upon a time. Mm. Like, we had to force... I don't know that many investors realise this. We had to force companies to publish balance sheets because yeah. people were buying shares in companies on, based on profit and loss statements with no mm. clear statement of assets and liabilities. So, you know, yes, there are steps being made in the right direction, but uh, we live in what the UN Secretary-General says is a critical decade. Mm. We don't have a lot of time. This is a climate change in particular is a unique policy problem. We have to solve it with a deadline. So to allow people to spend another three years saying we're net zero, we're carbon neutral, when they're not, mm. uh, we don't have a lot of time to solve mm. that. Yeah. And, and do you think that the climate-related financial disclosures will help? I think they will help. In, but, in the same way that releasing balance sheets may have helped some time ago? Uh, no, I indeed. I, I think they will help. Uh, but unless the information contained within them is verifiable, unless the information contained within them is widely understood by the people using the information, not by the people who presented the information, uh, then these things can actually do harm. Publishing a balance sheet is one thing. Publishing an accurate balance sheet is what we really want. So we have accounting standards, very clear accounting standards, to ensure that when listed companies are talking about what the value of their, uh, I don't know, their unsold stock is, we have very clear accounting statements and very detailed notes in the back of them so that people can really understand those things. So it's actually a form of greenwash to simply create a reporting regime and not put the effort and not put the power of the state behind people, holding people accountable for telling truth in that accounting scheme. Mm. But, I mean, as we've already covered, like, we, we've seen, you know, the ACCC and ASIC taking action um, and we've seen companies being hauled into the courts over these issues. So surely that's part of the process, like, set out the, the, what the new disclosures are, what the various different policies are, and then start to take action on them. I think uh, we heard Mr Grease say this morning that... Um, uh, they've noticed, like from the sweep they did, an awful lot of companies just immediately go, oh, whoops, OK, let's do that. Now, obviously, that's not ideal. You'd love to think that they would just automatically um, be deeply honest in the first place. Um, but do you see that kind of part? I mean, obviously, I, I take your point that that's not swift enough or, or sort of deep enough from, from your perspective. But it is kind of heading in the right direction. Well, as, yeah, I agree, and hopefully yeah. I made that clear in answering my last question. But, for example, having a three-year moratorium on civil action means that we're talking about 2028. 2028, that would be eight years into what the Secretary-General called the critical decade. So if we have to wait till 2028 before we can expect companies to be so confident in the claims they're making that they'd be willing to show up in court and defend them. But, uh, look, in terms of the specific companies, I think Polly probably has more knowledge than me. Oh, I, was, I was just going to add, I think it is very welcome and it is a step in the right direction. I think if all the companies that currently say that they're taking action and are following net zero plans and making climate disclosures, because, of course, you know, we're here because there's some very lofty claims being made, mm. surely they're best placed to be submitting accurate climate disclosures because they say that they've been doing things according to best practice for some time. Having the reporting is one thing, and the climate uh, risk disclosures are based on voluntary standards, which have been around for quite a while and have... That's why we're making them mandatory, but have failed to really result in any significant change. The disclosure is one thing. It's what happens after this, the disclosure. So my understanding is that the these businesses are compelled to make sustainability statements and uh, then, you know, investors, regulators, 
they then decide whether they want to invest in this company or, uh, and so forth, or whether the, whether the claims are credible. But there's still nothing compelling or requiring these companies to do anything about the emissions after they've disclosed them. And I suppose the idea is that you're exposed, so you do want to do something after the fact if it turns out that your climate disclosures aren't looking that great. But that's not explicitly said, and I think it's the so what after any disclosure is made. This is why the current voluntary status quo hasn't worked, and it's why the Task Force on Nature-Related Disclosures is probably going to be simul similarly underwhelming because so many companies are signing up to it but you don't actually have to do anything after you've reported what your risks are or what your actual, the damage you're causing or the emissions you're causing are. And I think that's a fundamental part of the puzzle there, that you need the regulation afterwards. Um, I could keep going, but I'll, I'll, <laughs> I might just put some on notice. The, the other thing I did want to touch on is your submission um, sort of talked about some of the offset methods that you don't believe are credible, and I know we've had this conversation before. Um, do you think that there are any carbon offset methods that are worthwhile? Um, well, it was the Chubb review that said that the human-induced regeneration credits weren't credible. It was the Chubb review that, having decided that there was a lot of uh, uh, low-quality human-induced regeneration credits in the system, <coughs> that those credits could continue to circulate in the system. Uh, so it's not just us. The Chubb review itself drew that conclusion. It just didn't conclude that we needed to do anything about it. And of course, the Chubb review only looked at a small number of all of the offset uh, methods. So, uh, look, do I think there are any uh, carbon credit methods that are credible? I would say it depends on the way that they're being used. The science is crystal clear. It is impossible to offset the emissions from new fossil fuel projects, impossible, uh, with land-based sequestration. That's what the science says, because the CO2 stays in the atmosphere for so long when you dig a CO, uh, carbon fuel up and burn it. So there is no offset available in Australia that can credibly be used to offset emissions from fossil fuel expansion, which is, of course, the major use of the credits. And that even leaves aside the issue that we're not measuring fugitive emissions at all accurately. We're using simple rules of thumb for fugitive emissions uh, for fossil fuel projects. So I, I think my answer would be no, because the main use of offsets is to justify fossil fuel expansion, and the science says you can't use offsets. So, so just... you wouldn't support any form of offsetting? No, I didn't say that. Oh, no, no, OK, question. But none of them are credible. Can I, so, no, yes, sorry, oh, thank can you, Ms. Hemmings. That? Um, I think the conversation about the veracity of individual carbon credit methods is ultimately a distraction from the way that they're being used. And I just want to distinguish between carbon credit and carbon offset because I think under the Emissions Reduction Fund we could have had a really credible system where we were paying farmers directly to store carbon. We could have incentivised, you know, the whole crediting system was a little bit strange, but uh, in theory there was. You, uh, the un it was sound, that principle, that we pay people to reduce their emissions. It got gamed for various reasons. But you could, you can, just say you have the most robust carbon credit method in the world where you literally have a vacuum cleaner sucking the carbon out at source from whatever the facility is. If it only ever covers scope one emissions, and by that I mean operational emissions, which is all that's required by regulation in Australia, and uh, I used to work for Climate Active, so I know how they calculate their scopes and kind of carve off what is offset, you're not factoring in the production of, of the facility that is making a carbon neutral claim. So it, it would be great, I think, everyone who is on the same side ultimately is having a fight about the credibility of individual carbon credit methods when actually the conversation should be about can these methods ultimately offset permanently the entirety of the emissions from whatever's going on over here and ultimately the science says no. So yes, you can have legitimate carbon credit methods the way they're being used is to facilitate ongoing 
or increased emissions or disincentivise decarbonisation because we have a capped price under the safeguard mechanism of, the mechanism of those credits. Okay. Um, now, you've just said you used to work for Climate Active, so I, I don't know if you want to answer this question or maybe Mr Dennis, but um, the Commonwealth has proposed reforms to Climate Active um, and has undertaken some consultations. I don't know if you were involved in any way in those consultations. No. Um, we made a submission. Okay. Oh, sorry, I wasn't. <laughs> um, one of those proposals in there is to require a kind of a real emission reduction, not an offset, um, as a sort of precondition to getting certification. Um, what's your perspective on that? Does that meet um, some of your concerns or...? It's a really good question and I think the response I gave in my submission is that the way Climate Active works is that it doesn't require a business who is making a claim currently of carbon neutrality, I understand that they're, they're sort of reviewing whether that term can be used, but you get Climate Active certification for a single product that you make, so Ampol sells, Ampol sells carbon neutral petrol. Um, Ampol as a whole is not a carbon neutral business. Uh, carbon energy. neutral petrol. Yes. Okay. In the Netherlands, that was cl classed as greenwashing by the advertising well, regulator. I'd say but in the pub, it'd be called bullshit. <laughs> that may have been somewhere in the ruling too. I'm not sure. But so you have a, or you have a carbon neutral event. So uh, a, an organisation might just run a single event, and that's a climate active event. Or you are a carbon neutral organisation, and this certification no longer exists. I believe they've pulled out of the program. But Tokyo Gas is a gas company that has investments in various gas projects around Australia, and they said they are a carbon neutral, climate active, carbon neutral organisation because they'd offset their offices. And that's some, there was something like 400 tonnes a year versus the investments in the various gas fields that, um, and other operations. So it's welcome that you have to have an emissions reduction plan. It's a voluntary scheme, so you can't enforce that plan. Uh, and my understanding is that under Climate Active, if you, you're going to pull out of the scheme if your business grows and your emissions subsequently increase and Climate Active says well, your emissions haven't decreased, so we're not going to certify you anymore. Like, that's the risk with voluntary schemes. If you are only requiring an emissions reduction strategy for a certain part of your business, so Ampol, I don't know how you can reduce the emissions in carbon neutral petrol, but just say a gas company has carbon neutral offices, they can have an emissions reduction plan for their electricity use, their energy efficiency use on site, but as a brand, there's no verification of whether emissions reduction are taking place across the broader brand, and I think that's what's one of the most problematic aspects of the scheme. And if you look at the Climate Active website, it makes a lot of claims about, you know, these we're supporting brands that are making a difference. Uh, they don't say we're supporting a part of a brand, a part of a business from a brand that is might be making a difference. So that's make even if you have a requirement to reduce emissions, it's only for that little scope that is certified. There's not a broader uh, plan. And that was one of our recommendations, is that Climate Active can either certify the fact that a business has bought some offsets, that's pretty much all they can say, because they don't check the veracity of the offsets, they don't check whether the business is actually Climate Active, or they provide start providing a much more useful tool, which would be to an, do an assessment of an entire brand and provide information for consumers, actual analysis in simple terms of what that brand and what that business is doing. And, and perhaps that would help level the playing field as um, our ACCC um, representative um, raised in terms of you know, greenwashing. If you, if you start to put rules in place, some people will be able to uh, know whether they meet them and other people won't because they just don't have the resources. Um, I think we'd better keep moving the, the call along. Um, uh, Senator Pocock. Thank you, Chair. Um, thank you very much for your, your time this morning. Your submission has a somewhat different focus to a lot of the submissions to this inquiry in that it focuses largely on the role of the government in greenwashing. 
And I mean, if you could take us through what the government has or has not done to facilitate um, greenwashing. You describe the government's approach to regulating this area as state-sponsored greenwashing. What do you what do you mean by that? Do you mind if I, <laughs> I, I suppose. Um, you know, we've, we find ourselves in this situation, having inquiry into greenwashing, and uh, Senator Hanson Young, you pointed out, we don't have a legislated definition of greenwashing, um, and it's been very hard, I think, for ASIC and ACCC, despite their best efforts, to take action, because ultimately, no one is breaking any laws because we really don't have any. Yes, we have that definition of misleading and deceptive conduct, but it seems pretty like a pretty high bar. It seems hard to meet that. Where the Australia Institute is coming from is, as I said in my opening comment, is that greenwashing is a symptom of a number of complex and related and often contradictory regulatory failures. And you can't address greenwashing by the private sector when the government's own climate policies are facilitating some of that behaviour, I would say all of that behaviour. So just what I mean by those contradictory policies is we've got a government that is still subsidising fossil fuels, yet businesses are expected to be making emissions reduction plans that they tell their shareholders or their customers about. Uh, there are no laws, <coughs> excuse me, to... <coughs> Sorry, there are no laws to reduce emissions in the absolute sense. Yes, under the safeguard, I understand the, the, what the word net means, but there's no requirements to ultimately decarbonise. Um, <clears throat> the climate reporting is limited and has caveats. If you looked at the government's safeguard mechanism against the UN's net zero greenwashing framework, or the, you know, the best practice net zero, or the, um, the ISO, net zero standards, which are based on that, the safeguard mechanism fails every single one of those elements. So unlimited offsets, ongoing fossil fuel expansion. Um, under those you know, as, uh, principles, you're not meant to lobby against good science-based climate policy. So if we've got a government that trouble. is failing best practice voluntary standards yeah. with its own policies, then what are the chances that other arms of government, in terms of regulators, are actually going to be able to address the problematic claims by businesses? So uh, just to add one more thing, which is also repeating what I said in my opening comment, it's cheaper to greenwash in Australia than not. Mm -hmm. It's cheaper to buy carbon off... It's cheaper to pay a certification fee to Climate Active and to buy some offsets from a wind farm um, than it is to implement the technology that you need or, or go 100% renewable or change your business practice or change your business model. Effectively, it's a, a really unfair situation for businesses who are trying to do the right thing because you've got a whole suite of, of government-certified carbon offsets under ACUS. You've got the Climate Change Authority giving a tick of approval to international carbon offsets that can be bought by Climate, climate Active, despite the fact that other international studies uh, have said that they were low quality. Um, then you've got the government providing a whole certification scheme saying this is... They've taken the language down now, but it used to be this is at a glance, you know, approval that, you're, that this business has met a claim. They've got a whole list of the businesses saying... As a consumer, every day you make choices that make the world a better place. These businesses are taking action, so they're effectively promoting some businesses over others, which is giving them an unfair competitive advantage. Why wouldn't you take all those options instead of doing the hard work? Because it's not illegal. Mm. It's, it's all... This is what I mean by state-sponsored greenwash. The government is giving it all to you. To you. And this is not a, a failure of this government. This is a successive failure over time. Um, I was going to add one more thing, and now I can't remember what it was. It was quite pertinent. So <laughs> I'll come back to it. <laughs> if you should remember it. Um, I guess when, when people hear government greenwashing, they're probably not thinking policy, and I, I think the point's very well made about facilitating that through things like the safeguard mechanism, then the sea dumping bill, and all the other things that we're, we're seeing. But in terms of advertising, we've seen 
the government talk about a misinformation bill, which they'll be totally carved out of, so a government can't be found to be engaging in mis or disinformation. When it comes to greenwashing, are there examples um, of a government, say, in the lead-up to an election before it's been called, and actually using advertising to promote credentials that don't really add up? Is this something we should be concerned about? I mean, truth in political advertising is a, a huge issue, and that's probably where that mm -hmm. leads what into... If it's like... before, what if it's before an election's called? Uh, look, I think it's a very interesting question, as Polly said, there's now, and I, your question creates an overlap between is it OK to mislead consumers mm -hmm. and or is it OK to mislead voters? Mm -hmm. uh, I think uh, a lot of both occurs uh, in Australia. Um, look, I, I think it's hard to overstate the significance of the answers we heard before to Senator Hanson Young's questions to the ACCC. You had the government, you had an arm of government literally selling a green tick of approval. Companies were paying cash to the government to get a green tick of approval, and that arm of government hadn't gone to the other arm of government mm -hmm. to... Well, they did go, and they were told their homework wasn't complete. Right. Well, they, but they were making public representations before mm -hmm. they'd even, you know, jumped over that <coughs> first hurdle. Mm -hmm. So... I think that's a, a very significant insight into how, uh, into how loose mm -hmm. we've become in Australia to just throwing these claims out. Personally, uh, I think that, you know, I, the Australian Institute's a research think tank. We get asked lots of questions that have political implications all the time. Uh, and in climate, it's really quite simple. I'm not a climate scientist, so I just keep coming back to what the UNFCCC says. Mm -hmm. And the UNFCCC says we need to rapidly reduce the amount of fossil fuels we produce and consume. Mm -hmm. And frankly, if a country's not doing that, it's, it's, mm -hmm. it's in denial about what the climate science says. Mm -hmm. Now, whether it's illegal to call yourself to have fossil... What's, what's the MPOL product? Fossil uh, carbon neutral petrol. Whether it's illegal to have carbon neutral petrol, mm. whether it's illegal for a gas company to call itself carbon neutral and whether it should be illegal for a government or a candidate or anyone to make a claim that they take climate change seriously when they support fossil fuel expansion, that's literally up to you guys to decide mm. because you make laws and we don't. But the science is really clear. What, what the world needs to do really quickly is produce and consume a lot less fossil fuels. And anyone making claims that they're 100% on board with that while actually going the other way is against the science. Mm. I think it's against consumer and national interests, but it's up to people who make the laws to decide whether it's against the law. And in terms of cl climate active, currently there's a review... What, what, what should happen to it? Is it redeemable or should, should it be scrapped? What's, what's the way forward there? Uh, my submission's quite long, so I'm just trying to work through it quickly in my head. I think, ultimately, Climate Active is displacing what should be a regulatory role. Uh, saying it, Relying on uh, voluntary claims has, worked, has failed across pretty much, you know, modern slavery, so many other spheres. Um, so I really worry about it crowding out the role of government here. Um, and, I mean, the thing is, I wonder what... I genuinely question why the businesses paying the licence fees to Climate Active are paying for it, especially with the... The, the action they're taking is not additional to the action that the government has already committed to taking. So effectively, if they're footing the bill to help Australia m meet its climate targets, I'm just not sure what the, the ROI to businesses is. Um, if Climate Active disappeared tomorrow, the government would have to, have to find other ways to get the private sector to take action, I guess is my point. As I said um, earlier on, I think broadly, I mean, I think Climate Active needs to re be referred to the Auditor-General. There are so many administrative failures, not just the ones that we've talked about today, you know, not checking the offsets, um, EY carrying out 
uh, being paid a million dollars by the department to carry out due diligence on the members while also having those members as clients, while also assessing the veracity of the international offsets. There's, there's just so much that has, is wrong with that scheme. But if the government wants to keep a voluntary carbon offset scheme, then the most climate active can be described as is kind of as it used to be the national carbon offset standard. All the, gov all the department can really say is these businesses have provided us with a list of their emissions for part of their business and they've bought some offsets and they may or may not be reducing their emissions across their whole value chain. Or it could live up to the name, which is a very lofty name, Climate Active, and assess whether businesses are doing are climate active, whether brands are climate active, whether they're actually someone that consumers could see a proper, on a, on a, a shelf. Certification process. Yeah, or not even a certification, just this is an information verification. service. Mm. Your verification. Well this is a service for consumers where we've provided you all the information and we're trying to make it job easier for consumers to understand what this business is saying. Is it, a, is it a climate active business? And it might get a tick, not a certification, just some, I think there is such appetite for, oh, I would love it as a consumer, but also as a researcher to find a resource that actually told me what a company is saying when they make these claims. I don't know if you've ever read Woodside's Net Zero Target. It's about 500 words long and it's incomprehensible. It's like chat GPT wrote it. Um, but if I had a translation service, that would be incredibly value, valuable for consumers and for businesses trying to do the right thing. So that was, um, that was a long-winded answer. I think it could be redeemed. Can I just say, I, if the objective of Climate Active is to be a provider trusted certification, its behaviour to date is going to make that a very tough sell. So if, and it's a big if, that that's what the government wants to persist with, I'd suggest creating a new structure and a new name and start from scratch because the idea that the government has literally certified fossil fuel companies that are expanding as climate leaders, like that's, that's one of the sales pitches. If you, if you pay money to this arm of government to get our green tick, our website will describe you as a climate active leader. Can I just add one more thing to that? Climate active uh, certified British American tobacco as carbon neutral and uh, despite carrying out a risk assessment, it was still certified and then the Department of Health contacted DQ, I understand, and raised concerns because we have a you know international treaty that you can't advertise mm -hmm. fossil fuel, uh, cigarette companies. There's no international treaty on the health impacts of fossil fuels or climate change, but the World Health Organization provides very clear advice on the impact that fossil fuels are having on our health, including air quality, as well as extreme heat and warming. Um, but that's a clear example of a tobacco company using greenwashing to overcome other public perception. Yeah, exactly. But if the World Health Organization is providing guidance on the impact of fossil fuels on human health, and Climate Active is actively carrying out risk assessments of everyone it certifies, I would have thought that while there is no international treating it, it, uh, on fossil fuels, if the World Health Organization has very strong statements on tobacco, would you not look at the same sorts of frameworks and see what is said about being uh, fossil fuels, said about fossil fuels and their health impacts? And as clim wouldn't Climate Active look at the risk to their own brand and the risk to their other members who may legitimately be climate active in certifying fossil fuels. Mm. Um, we are really running out of Sorry. time. Senator Dunningham, do you have questions? I've just got a couple, thanks, Chair. Um, I just wondered if uh, you might be able to give me a sense of how many uh, complaints or referrals have been made by the Australia Institute to any of the entities that appeared before ASIC ACCC around greenwashing? We made a complaint to the ACCC about Climate Active. Just the one? Just the, well, it was fairly substantial, but yes, just the oh, one. Yeah, sorry, I mean, in yeah. terms of greenwashing, I, I'm yeah. aware of that one. It was well, talked about earlier, but yeah. Well, I suppose we're a public policy think tank, so our focus is on policy that would get to the root cause of greenwashing rather than a spot fire approach to individual companies. 
Oh, no, simple mm-hmm. question, and I think the answer was one. So that's fine. I, I just wanted to get to the bottom of that. To the more substantial issue, um, you know, have, with the work you've done, and clearly it is extensive, is there a model in another jurisdiction uh, that Australia would do well to uh, replicate or take parts of to implement in our own sort of regulatory approach to greenwashing if we went down that pathway? I think the EU Parliament is probably leading the world uh, with the reforms that they're making. Other countries have implemented regulations such as France where you can't advertise fossil fuels, you can't advertise um, emissions intensive cars I believe and airlines so that would be a very good start as well. Uh, if you want to make, take it bigger about what would get to the root cause, if we stopped subsidising and exporting fossil fuels in Australia and made it easier to decarbonise uh, or signed the, committed to the fossil fuel treaty, such as Colombia has just done, then that would make it would take a lot of the issues of greenwashing away and you wouldn't necessarily have to then implement greenwashing legislation after the fact. Mm. Um, just quickly, I, I, as I said before, we've been in this situation before in relation to other areas, and while I, I take uh, Polly's lead in terms of international uh, examples for greenwashing, but I think we've solved disclosure problems in the finance sector before. We've solved disclosure problems in other domains of regulation before, and I, I think that if we brought a similarly enthusiastic consumer protection approach and uh, policy simplification approach, I think we could solve a lot of these greenwashing problems just looking at what we've done elsewhere in Australia. Mr Dennis, I'm not into reinventing the world, which is why I ask the question sometimes <laughs> it's easy to look at other jurisdictions and perhaps get a head start so that we don't have to go from ground zero. I'd be um, happy to take that on notice and provide you an outline of what could be done. That would be great. Thank you very much. And indeed, just as a part of that, I'm, I'm interested in whether any analysis has been done around the cost to consumers around uh, compliance regimes of this nature. I mean, we're in a cost of living crisis allied to the climate crisis we've talked about before. I just want to know uh, if any of these participating organisations have seen a bump up in cost. I mean, if, if that is part of any of the research you've done, I'd be interested. I, I, one final question I have, and of course not all greenwashing is about climate, it's about all sorts of environmental uh, destruction or impact, um, and you know, which is why I'm a bit confused. We've, we've talked about tobacco companies getting some sort of green tick for being carbon neutral notionally, but I, you know, I, I'm not going to go down that pathway. But in terms of a company that might be purchased by an international organisation, um, you know, and the, the company, uh, for, for instance, here in Tasmania, we've got Hue and Aquaculture operated here for 30 or 40 years, um, and putting aside whether or not their activities, um, you know, have been subject of greenwashing, they were purchased by an international, a, a multinational corporation, JBS, well known to, I'm sure, many people sitting around both sides of the table here. Let's say Hewan had a great environmental track record and got the tip legitimately under whatever regime and then was purchased by a company that um, it was much harder to penetrate their international operations. How do you propose you would deal with a situation like that? Um, you know, is that something that changes the originally Australian, in fact Tasmanian company's approach and track record uh, and then suddenly that company and its employees take ownership of an international organisation's approach. How do you deal with that uh, in any regime that we bring forward? Um, I might let Polly answer the second question. The first one in terms of cost of living, we haven't done any analysis on the actual costs uh, of, of compliance or regulation. Um, but one thing that stands out is that often the companies and the brands making these positive environmental claims are selling their products at a premium. So I think in a cost of living crisis, it's sort of more important than ever to make sure that consumers aren't being misled into paying over and above 
uh, what what something costs to produce uh, because of these claims. So. Uh, yeah, can't, can't help with the regulatory bit, but I think misleading people in a cost of living crisis. We've been down this route with dolphin safe tuna and, uh, you know, um, uh, detergents that, you know, did or didn't include certain ingredients. We, we do know how to solve it, but yeah, I, I am concerned in a cost of living crisis that people are paying a premium for environmental attribu attributes that might not exist. Uh, I would just quickly add to that. Um, I'll, I'll use the climate example and the climate active example again. If you're buying offsets and making a, claim, a green claim against them, you're purchasing those offsets year on year on year on year in, in perpetuity. If it was easy for a business to purchase renewable energy or have solar on site or implement um, energy efficiency technology, their operating costs would ultimately be reduced. Obviously, it's context dependent and, and industry specific, but really uh, operating in a legitimately green fashion with the right regulatory settings should be much cheaper than operating at business as usual, but spending a lot on a marketing team to try and contort what you're doing or purchasing offsets every single year. So that, that goes to the cost component. That was to the cost component. As far as, uh, you know, if a, an Australian the, the, business... The hypothetical? The hypothetical. Yeah, <laughs> the... the, the, the <laughs> so, I mean, Just say... Like, yeah. I'm, I'm talking about from a model here mm. that might work and what happens in various circumstances. I think you have if to... If you want to take my cameo on notice, you're happy, I'm happy for you to do so. No, I'm happy to give you a high-level answer. And this, again, has happened under Climate Active uh, where uh, you had... Power shop, I think, was bought by Shell, and a lot of people revolted over, not physically, not literally, but maybe felt revolted, uh, because Power shop was bought by Shell, yet was maintaining its climate active certification. Now, I don't know what the status of that is, but a brand is going to be subject to consumer scrutiny. It might not even, you might not even get to the regulatory stage where you have consumers saying, hang on a minute, this has been bought by a big international conglomerate we're not going to be part of it anymore. So they might instigate their own greenwashing um, actions. Or, uh, but I'm not actually sure... Well, no, I suppose this is why it's really important to look at a brand as a whole. You can't carve off a brand. You can't carve off Ampol's EV charging stations from the rest of Ampol. You need to look at an entire brand whether and its operations globally and in Australia. And that is a struggle for regulators and that is going to be a struggle for um, you know, voluntary certification schemes like Climate Active. All right. Well, thank you so much. Um, we are um, well over time. So if there's any other questions from people uh, on the round the table on notice, um, we'll put them to you. Uh, thank you both for appearing today. Thanks for watching. If you enjoy our videos, make sure to subscribe and hit the bell button to get notified when we publish a new one. See you next time.